Uh, we've talked a little bit about this, but from a different perspective, so I want to share some things with you. So grab your Bibles and go to Exodus chapter 20. Let me read verses 1 through 6. Then I will pray, and then we're going to review and talk through um, what God would have us to receive. Say amen if you're here. Verse 1 says, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or a graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Let us pray then. We're going to go to the word. Holy Spirit, you're awesome, you're wonderful, you're kind, you're merciful, you're gracious. As we engage scripture this morning, you're doing something phenomenal here, and, and we just love it. But teach us more of what it means to be like you, what it means to adjust towards you, and teach us how to become who you would have us to be. So we give you praise. We bless your holy name, Lord. We magnify you for what you're doing. Now speak through me. I pray for preaching power. I say this every Sunday, but Felix dies because Felix has nothing to say unless the Holy Spirit speaks through me. So may your word go forth, permeate hearts, and encourage someone to be more of what you would have them. It is in your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen, amen. So last week when we brought the message, we um, picked up, we, we spent some time in the book of Isaiah chapter 43, and I spoke from that passage or the concept of just praising that we worship God for who he is, not so much for what he has done. And four things that we shared with you from last week's message is that, number one, we need to know, to know God. Now, repeat on me. Say, self. self. I, need to know God. I need to know God. Not only do we need to know God, because a lot of us will say that we know him, but God has a unique way of working, a unique way of doing what he does. So in addition to my knowledge of God, I need to understand God. So come on, say, self. self. I need to understand God. It's one thing to know him, right? And it's another thing to understand him. Come on, y'all. Because the reason we get our feelings hurt is when we don't understand how he operates and how he does what he does. But if I know him and I understand him, then I must get to the place where I trust him. Oh, come on, y'all. So listen, say, self, I must trust God. Amen. Very, very important because God will call you and he will call me to do things and to take us out of our comfort zone. And we may have a knowledge of him. We may have an understanding of him. But if we don't know what it means to trust him, we won't obey him. Oh, come on, talk to me this morning. And so we must get to that place. But finally, when we know him, when we understand him, when we trust him, that results in us praising him. So one more time, say, self, I must get to the place where I praise God. So I want to tap into that fourth concept of the fact that God works on our behalf so we can praise him for who he is, not so much for what he does. And as we looked at that extensively through the lens of the prophet Isaiah, we're going to read a little bit to the book of Exodus and kind of revisit, revisit a couple of things that God was saying to Moses on that mountain as it relates to the worship of God so we can get to the place where we're moving to be who God would have us to be. So I'd love for you to hang your hat on this thought this morning as we go through the text. And here's what it says. Because of who God is and what he has done for us, he alone, he alone. I've got to say this again. Let's come turn your neighbor. neighbor. Not you. Not Amen. He alone, he alone. He deserves our praise. Right. Let me read that one more time. Because of who God is and what he has done for us. He alone deserves our worship. So here is my preaching idea that I want you to take away, and then we're going to walk through the text. Whatever you do, make a resolution or resolve to worship God. <laughs> Come on, y'all. Resolve to worship God. Resolve to worship God. And we'll talk through that a little bit to get to where we need to go. If you're still in the book of Exodus chapter 20, here's what you need to know by way of literary context to kind of lay a foundation for us to walk through what the text is saying to us. Understand with me that prior to the book of Exodus, the Israelites found themselves 
in captivity in, the, um, in Egypt. Now, how they got to Egypt is very, very important for you to know. It was a series of providential events where, you remember Joseph, anybody in here remember Joseph? Where, where Joseph was chosen by God through a series of events to, that his brothers would take him through such that he would end up on the throne in Egypt. And when, when Joseph on that throne or in Potiphar's house, you remember the fa famine that occurred during that day in the land, and God had Joseph positioned to rescue his people such that they can go into Egypt and be preserved when the famine takes place. Now, here's what you need to know about the opening of Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1, verse 8, opens up this way. It says, after the Israelites had made it to Egypt, and then Joseph died, and then all that generation with him died. Verse 8 says it this way, there came a new king on the scene who knew not Joseph. Okay? Now, what's paramount about that statement to lay foundation for what we're going to talk about is not so much that the king did not know Joseph. He had to have heard about Joseph because he had to have known that the deed that Joseph did is what was preserving his nation or preserved his nation at the time. But what I think the author is trying to get you and I to understand is that this king came on the scene and he did not know the God of Joseph. Come on, y'all, there's a big difference. Are you with me? He didn't know the God of Joseph, and because he did not know the God of Joseph, he subjected the people of God to cruel and unusual punishment. There's a parenthetic that I need to make right there because you need to understand that as culture shift, as if we were to look at what's happening in government today, it, it's almost as if there's a new king on the scene that didn't know Joseph's God. Come on, am I talking to myself? If you look at what's happening culture shifting where people are moving away from who God really is, and whenever we move away from who God really is, there's consequences for the people of God. Does that make sense? Now, the Israelites find themselves in Egypt, and they've been there for 400 years. Now, y'all, 400 years, that's no short time. That's a long time, y'all. Come on. That's a long time where they had been in slavery for 400 years. And here's what that meant for the, for the duration of that 400 years. The pharaohs of Egypt assimilated the people of God into the ways, the methods, the worship, and all of this stuff. And where you had a people that worshiped God for who he is, after 400 years, their worship looks completely different. I mean, you understand with me that Egypt was a polytheistic nation. And what is meant by that, it was a nation that had many gods and that worshipped many gods. They had a god for just about everything, a god for the sun, a god for the moon, a god of fertility, a god for the rain. They had a god for everything. And for 400 years, these people who were used to worshiping one god found themselves having a choice now of which god they ought to worship. Come on, am I just talking to myself, or do you see yourself in the picture here? And then now, at the end of 400 years, God raises up Moses, and Moses' commission is to go to Pharaoh to say to him, let my people go. And I said this last week, and it's worth repeating again, they weren't let go for the mere pleasure of being let go. There was divine intention attached to their liberation, meaning they were let go so they can worship God. I need a couple more amens. Because, you see, you and I have fooled ourselves into thinking that our salvation is simply to benefit our own kingdom. But God saved you so you can serve him. Come on. God saved you so you can worship him. He didn't save you just for the mere pleasure of being your savior. While we wait for the bus ride to glory, there's work to do. So God, God now sends Moses to deliver the Israelites, and as Moses has delivered them, they are now making the journey. Let me fast forward. They're making the journey from Egypt to Canaan. And on the sojourn on the way from Egypt to Canaan, there's a pit stop that happens on Mount Sinai. And the Israelites find themselves now at the base of Mount Sinai. Moses and, and, and um, Joshua transcends the mountain to hear a word from God. Listen to how I'm going to say this. Because for 400 years, they've been doing things a certain way. Come on, y'all. 
For 400 years, they had a mode of worship. They had a mode of operation. They had a mode of the way they were doing things. And God was not going to let them go into Canaan with the way they did things in Egypt. Does anybody know that this morning? That you can't, come on, y'all, serve God the way we did things in Egypt. So there's this pit stop. And along the way at this pit stop, God brings Moses up the mountain. And he issues Moses instruction, and here's the word I need, I need you to hear me say, so he can reprogram people who have been programmed to do things a certain way for 400 years. He had to debrief them. He had to take everything that they learned and take everything out of them, the way they used to do things, to conform them to a new way because it was going to be different. This is why it was so important last week where God said, behold, I'm doing a new thing. Come on, does that make sense? So he's reprogramming them. Come on, say reprogramming. He's reprogramming them, and mountain, I mean, Moses finds himself up the mountain, and God now issues what's known as the Ten Commandments, or better stated, the Decalogue, or ten things he expects them to do, which ends up being the foundation for Israelites' life and history. So look with me at the text, and there's four simple things that I need to share with you about the text. Notice what it says. And God spoke all these words saying, and the first thing he says before he even issues the command, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. Four things. Number one, as we look at the text, God wanted the Israelites to understand, first of all, that God alone deserved to be worshipped. I need a couple of more amens. God alone deserved to be worshipped. If you were here last week, I spent a lot of time talking about who God is. But you remember with me, just to kind of capture this up real fast so we can move on. When Moses was in the wilderness on the backside of the desert, and God came to him and said, I need you to go to Pharaoh. Remember with me, Moses' request of God was, when I go to Pharaoh, shall I say sent me? In other words, understand God that Pharaoh and Egypt has a lot of you. Come on, y'all. It's a polytheistic nation. There's a lot of gods there. So which one are you? And here's God's response to Moses. You just need to tell him, I am that I am. Y'all, y'all, come on, y'all. That, that, yeah, yeah. You see, Moses, if I give you a name, I wish I had somebody in here. <laughs> You'll restrict me to the descriptive of that name. Come on. And if I don't respond to that name, it'll mess you up because you might know me, but you might not really understand me. And if I don't respond to the name that you're used to calling me, you might not trust me. I wish I had somebody in here. And if you don't trust me based on the name that I don't respond to, guess what? You won't praise. I wish I had somebody in here. And the reason you and I don't praise God is because he don't respond to the name that we expect him to respond to. Mama's sick. And because he doesn't mama, you can't praise him. I, I wish I had somebody in here. You're broken because he doesn't give you money. You can't praise him because you've restricted him to, I wish I had somebody in here. So Moses, you just tell Pharaoh, I am that I am. Here's what that means grammatically. It's the ever-present tense of the verb to be, meaning I can be whatever you need me to be at the time that you need me to be it. I'm God all by myself. You can't box me in. Yeah. Grandma damn didn't have good theology, but they'd say, baby, he's bread to the hungry. Baby, he's water to the thirsty. Baby, he's a mother to the motherless. He's a father to the fatherless. Whatever you need, just I wish I had somebody in here. Whatever you need, he can be it because I am that I am. Is that? That's what God is saying. He says, I am that I am. Come on, repeat out of me. Say, say, I am. I am. That I am. I am. Come on, say it again. Say, I am. I am. That, I am. that I am. And then lock into this. Not only does he say he does define himself, but then he tells them what he did. Look at this. I am the God, and notice his descriptors. We spent some time last week. Who brought you out of Egypt? Out of the house of slavery. Don't fool yourself, Moses, into thinking that you did that by yourself. I need to pray in church this morning. 
You see, because my problem is sometimes I get caught up in myself and I fool myself into thinking that my education got me the job. <laughs> and God wants us to know he's the one who did it. Sometimes we fool ourselves into thinking that it's the counselor who got me off drugs. No, 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 no. It was God who got you from that bonded situation. Sometimes we think that the only reason I escaped Pookie and them is because I ran. No, don't make that mistake. No, no, no. It was God who brought you out of the house of bondage. Come on, are you with me? Had it not been for the Lord, we'd still be in that slavery situation. Moses, I wish I could give you a name, but it won't do you no good. But recognize, like the kids would say, you better recognize. <laughs> recognize who I am and what I did. So he says, I alone, only God deserves your worship. And then in addition to that, here's the thing he says that he goes into the command. And then he says this secondly, never share my glory with anyone or anything else. I wish I had. Let me, let me help you. Look at the text. Look at the text. Look at the text. Verse 2 says, well, verse 2, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of slavery, out of the house, I mean, the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Look at verse 3. First thing, Moses, you better recognize. It's the Ebonics version. You shall have what? No other gods. Where? Come on, one more time. You shall have where? One more time, one more time for that person to sleep. And you shall have what? But where? Let me help you understand the depth of the statement that God is saying to Moses. Most of us, when we read that passage and throughout the duration of our Sunday school years, we have, those of us that know a little theology, have equated this to being God saying, I am preeminent. Meaning, I'm the most supreme God. I'm first. Don't put nothing else in front of me. But remember with me, that's God is reprogramming. Come on, say reprogramming. He's reprogramming them from the way they did worship for 400 years to a new way of doing things now that they have been delivered from slavery. So here's what God is really saying to them. This has to do more with presence than it has to do with preeminence. Now, let me tell you what I mean by that. Don't worry. Let me help you understand. Egyptian, the Egyptian dynasty functioned this way. They had what was known as a pantheon. Now, here's what a pantheon means. Don't get hung up on it. A pantheon means that you have a plurality of gods that work together to govern a particular nation or a country. So here's what happened for 400 years. For 400 years, here's what Egypt looked like being a nation that functioned as a pantheon. They had a God for the water. Come on. They had a God for the rain. They had a God for the sun. Come on. They had a God for, for fertility. They had a God for this. And then, in addition to all the gods they had, they had a God of gods. And that's Pharaoh's role. Pharaoh was the God over God. So you have to understand with me, when, God when Moses encountered God at the burning bush, here's what he said. You realize where you're sending me? Do you realize their theology, how they're... They are a, they, they, it's a pantheon form of government, meaning they have many gods. So which one are you? Because Pharaoh's going to ask me, which one is he? Y'all not getting this. Y'all not getting this. Right? Right? So, so here's what God is saying when he said to, to Moses, don't have no other God before me. Here's what he's saying. Moses, I need you to recognize, right? I just brought you after 400 years of being in a polytheistic situation where it's governed by a pantheon of gods to realize God all by myself. Yeah. I wish I had somebody. I don't need no help. Yeah, because got to happen. 
Pharaoh declares that he is God. Yet if it stops raining, as God, he doesn't have the ability to make it rain. He's got to go to one of his gods and say, I order you to make it rain. I wish I had somebody in here. You remember with me when Moses had his staff and he put it in his dung? Pharaoh just called his gods and said, hey, you know how to do that. Do that. And here's what God's saying. God says, if I need it to rain, I make it rain all by myself. If I need the sun to rise, I call the sun up all by myself. Y'all not hearing me. If I need anything to happen on the face of the earth, I am God all by myself. I am a monotheistic deity, and I don't need no power. I I had somebody in here. So let the record reflect. For 400 years, you had a whole lot of stuff going on. The change is just me and you, baby. I wish I had somebody. Listen, listen, in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 5, there's a story, right? 1 Samuel chapter 5, where the Philistines worship this god, pagan god called Dagon. And you'll remember this quite well, where when the Philistines engaged the Israelites in, in battle, the Israelites had forgotten to take the Ark of the Covenant with them. So needless to say, the Philistines defeated the Israelites. So here's what they did. They go into Israelite camp, and they take the Ark of the Covenant, which is representative of the presence of God, and they take it back to their temple. And they put the Ark of the Covenant in the temple. Then they go get their God, Dagon, and they bring him and place him in the temple with God. They go to bed. Next morning they wake up. There's Dagon face down. You see, they hadn't read Exodus chapter 20 where God said, you shall have. Y'all no, yeah, get it, y'all get it, y'all get it. So here's what they said. He must have slipped and fell. So they picked him up, and they put him back in the presence of God, and then they went to bed. Somebody should have warned them and said, you should have read Exodus chapter 20. I wish I had a praying church. The next morning they got up. Not only was he face down, but his head was gone. His arms was falling off, and only his torso was left. And what God was trying to say, I'm God all by myself. Don't you put no other God in my presence because I will not share my glory with anyone else. Now, here's the thing. You're wondering why your life is all messed up. You're wondering why you can't get things together. Well, quit bringing other gods in the temple where God resides. You've got to recognize this. And when I say temple, I'm not talking to church. I'm talking about your bodies. And we bring unauthorized gods in the temple where God resides. And he will have no other God living where he lives. So Moses, 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 tell the folk it's been 400 years. And you had the God of this and the God of that and the God of this and the God of that. If you're going to walk with me, you better start getting rid of all these things because the moment you bring them to the temple where I reside, to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you better get to killing. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm telling you, I'm telling you. If you want to know why the cycle has been going on, come on, why you can't get it together, why things can't seem right, and here you are, you got Pookie in the temple, and Pookie don't even know God. I wish I had somebody in here. <laughs> and you wonder why you and Pookie can't get along. All the counseling in the world ain't going to poop nothing. Are you with me? You got the wrong God in the wrong place where I wish I had somebody. So that's why Scripture says don't be unequally yoked. Can we talk this morning? So, 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 I don't share my glory. I don't share my glory. So here's what he says. You shall have no other God before me. Here's what that means. Don't bring nothing unauthorized in my presence. Ah, I don't need help. I'm a pantheon. I'm a monotheistic deity. I am one God. So here's what he says in Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, he is one. You shall worship him alone. I don't know about you, but I'm not signing up to serve a God who needs help. Y'all not hear me. Because if he needs help, he's not God all by himself. Come on with you. 
So I'm not signing up a gut to serve a God that can't do it by himself. And by virtue of the fact of who he is, I am that I am. What do you need, Felix? I've got it. And if I don't got it, I can create it because I'm God all by myself. That's the kind of God we serve. Come on, I wish somebody would say hallelujah in here. We serve a God like that. So listen, don't try to share my glory. Don't share my glory. Come on, say don't share his glory. Say it again, say don't share his glory. Don't do it, don't do it. Don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. I'm not going to make it through it. So, so, so look at the next thing he says. Look at, look at the next thing he said, right? Watch this. Worship me as spiritual, not material. I didn't do a good job with that this morning. Try to do a little better. Worship me as what? Not what? One more time. Worship me as what? Spirit. Not what? Spirit. Okay, let me, let me show it to you in the text and let's walk it out. Notice what he says. So, Moses, one, I don't share my glory. Number two, worship me as spiritual, not material. Verse four, after he said in verse three, don't have no, God, no other gods before me, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness, or anything in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not, what's that? Bow down to them. You shall not do what? Serve them. Come on, I'll worship them. Why? Because I, the Lord your God, and what kind of a God? Say he's reprogramming. Say it again. Say he's reprogramming. For 400 years under the Egyptian dynasty, being a polytheistic nation and a pantheon form of government, here's what happened. In Egypt, the Israelites were responsible to build, listen to what I'm going to say, the gods. So here's what that meant. Bricks out of straw, they were building Pharaoh's empire. They were, if Pharaoh had a god for this, they were the ones... And you're going to get this next week when we talk about that golden calf. Y'all going to understand this. And so they were the ones responsible to build the image that the people worshipped. Oh, come on, y'all. Y'all know this, right? So here, Here's what would happen. For every deity that they had, they had an image that was representative of the deity. Come on, if you were to do your work on, on Egyptian history, uh, you see all the images that are set up, and all these images are representative of the variant gods. Come on, talk to me, y'all, the variant gods that they were worshiped. Now, here's the deep thing. We, we know that images don't mean nothing from a Christian worldview and from a Christian perspective. So the life of that thing became the fact and the way that it looked. Now, we knew it was inanimate, it had no life in him, but they did not know know that. So what they would do is when they wanted to worship or they wanted rain, they would go between before the image that looked like the rain god and they would worship that thing and they would give homage to the thing. Come on, y'all seen this. If you've traveled and gone to other countries that are pagan worshipers, you see all these images that look, that represent the varying gods that they worship. Come on, those of you that came out of Catholicism, you know what I'm talking about. Come on, y'all. Images all over the place. And here's what God says. Worship the spiritual not the material, right? So, so here's what this looked like. If, if, this thing, if this thing were supposed to be representative of a God, here's what the people would do. They would set this thing up, and they would say, that is our God of fertility. Let's say for the sake of conversation. If woman was bar barren, husband would take wife, and they would offer sacrifices they would make offerings. They would make everything to this image that they had created, hoping that the image would respond to them. Now listen to God. Don't make the mistake. I know it's been 400 years, and you're used to building images. I wish I had somebody here. Now, as you move forward, don't make the mistake creating an image and then worshiping the image more than you worship the creator. 
yeah, yeah. Because here's what happens. We do the same thing. We do the same thing. We do the same thing. Come on. God blesses us with a car. And here's what we do. Hey, y'all, look at my car. Y'all not hearing me. Y'all not hearing me. And, and then here's what we do. We thank God. I thank you for the car. I wish I had somebody in here. And here's what happens. If the car falls and the car breaks, y'all not hearing me, something impacts our worship and we can't worship God no more because the image has been messed up. Maybe y'all not getting this. Y'all not getting this. God, I thank you for the house. Yeah, God, and, and we spend more time thanking him for the house versus thanking him for him. Yeah. Don't worship the material. Worship the spiritual. So here's what. If God heals me, you don't worship me because God healed me. You thank him for being a healer. I wish I had somebody in here. If God gives me a house, I don't worship the house. I thank him for being Jehovah Jireh regardless of the house. If God, let me go here, you'll appreciate this. If God gives me a wife or a husband, I don't worship the spouse. I worship God because here's what happened. The moment the divorce takes place, worship stops. And here's you. Y'all pray for me. My image of God ain't acting right. And then the image impacts the worship. Oh, I know I'm talking the truth in here of the spiritual. And God says, he's saying this, if you worship the spiritual, not the material, it doesn't matter what the material does, the spiritual will always be intact. So here's what that means. No mood, no emotion, no situation, no circumstance, come on, no heartache, nothing in this world can inhibit my praise because it's not about the thing. It's about who he is. It's about who he is. And you and I, we're humans. We want to see what God is doing so we can worship. So we erect temples. And here's what he says in Corinthians. Be careful of worshiping created things more than you worship what? You get what I'm saying. I love my wife, but I love God more. Are you with me? Come on, y'all. I have my own frailties, weaknesses, and shortcomings in life. But the older I'm getting, I'm realizing that stuff does not define who God is. So here's what that looks like. In the storm, because it's material, I can still worship. Come on. In the bad times... I can still worship. I wish I had somebody here. Y'all, y'all, y'all not here. Y'all, yeah, y'all, maybe you know, you already know all this stuff. It doesn't matter what the enemy throws at me. I can still worship. Watch this, because it's not about the material. It's about the spiritual. So here it is, Moses. Here it is, here it is. Don't make no graven image. Don't create nothing, right? Because here's how this plays itself out. Y'all still looking at me funny, like, ah, that, that, you talking about the person sitting next to me. Let me go here, let me go here. Here's what happens. God blesses you with the material, and, we, and he says, don't worship this thing, worship me. And here's what happens. He gives you a new car, and then the car payment comes due. And he says, don't worship this, worship me. And you look at your money. Hey, God, I need to drive this car so I can go to church. So I tell you what, I need to make the payment. Oh, y'all don't like this now. Or, or he blesses you with the house, right? Or he blesses you with whatever the situation is. And he says, don't worship this, worship that. But yet and still, in our everyday life, here's the decisions we make. We put the material. So here's what he said, Moses, don't make nothing look like me. Don't box me in. Because here's what will happen. You'll start worshiping this more than you worship me. Check your checkbooks if you don't believe me. <laughs> We're all guilty. Can we be honest this morning? 
Can we be honest? We're all dead. But, but here's, and, and here's the thing. I'm almost done. It's been 400 years of doing it that way. That's a long time. That's a long time. 400 years of doing it like that. And all of a sudden, God says, hey, I know it's been a long time, but this is what the new looks like. You got to know me. You got to understand me. And you got to trust me. Trust me. Trust me. Right? And we miss that. We miss that. I'm almost there. Because here's what this says. Here's what this says. I want you all to get this. Here's the next thing this thing says, right? Is that improper worship then, here's what it does. It invites the wrath of God for how long? Generations to come. Look at the text. Look at the text. Look at the text. I'm almost there. It says here, for I, the Lord your God, and what kind of a God? A jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me. Come on, say he's jealous. Yeah. Say it again. Say he's jealous. Yeah. Because here's what he's saying. I would never do that to you. Why? Because you and I are created in his image and in his likeness. And here's what he did. He gave himself for us. Then he expects that we do the same. And look at what disobedience does. You, you, now you're on the Israelites coming out of Egypt going into a Syrian captivity, God delivering them. You say, come and read the judges, going back into captivity. God delivers them. Then they end up in Babylonian captivity, which is what we saw last week. God delivers them, and they go up and down, up and down. And here's what he's saying. And it's not just you. It goes through your lineage. So here's what that means. Mommy and daddy don't get it right. All you got to do is look at your children. And you see the same cycles. Then the grandbabies come on the scene. And you look at the grandbabies. And then here's what you say, dang, can we get this right? And it comes down to basic disobedience, listen to this, because of improper worship. Finally, look at this. Proper worship, it invites the blessing of God for how long? But showing steadfast love to thousands of those who do what? Love me and do what? Keep my commandments. Moses, it's been 400 years of all of this stuff. If you want to stop the up and down, keep disobeying me. If you want life to be up one moment, down the next, and up, the, up one moment, and down the next, and up one moment, and down the next, keep what you're doing. But here's the, I'm trying to tell you, if you want to be consistent in the good times and in the bad times, in the difficult times, in the in-between times, don't share my glory. Worship the spiritual, not the material, and watch what I'm going to do. In other words, just praise me. Resolve to worship me. I was sharing with the first service, my prayer is this, I'm praying for the day when we come to worship, that church starts at 11 o'clock, but at 10.30, the parking lot is packed because other people can't get out. Not because you're waiting for 11 o'clock to start so worship can begin. It's because you're coming from the cars and running and filling this altar, waiting for the presence and the glory of God. Pastor Steve don't have to get up and say, well, the worshipers come down. You'll walk in the door and you'll be standing here praying, worshiping, serving God before the worship team even takes the platform such that when the worship begins, the glory, the Shekinah glory of God will permeate this house so healing is taking place and deliverance is taking place and miracles are taking place because praise has its right place in our life. So listen, Moses, it's been 400 years and you're confused on who to worship. Get it right with me. Get it right, just me and you, Moses. Go tell them that and watch what I'm gonna do. Repeat after me. Say, self, self. Today, today, I resolve to worship. Resolve. One more time. Say, self, self. I resolve to worship. Resolve. Come on, worship team. Come on, Pastor K. Bow your heads with me. Let's talk through this. Let's pray. Bow your heads with me. Come on, everybody in here, stand to your feet. Just stand to your feet. Just stand to your feet. Just stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. If you're like me, man, you've blown it. If you're like me, haven't been consistent, 
And this word now is showing us something completely different. Here's what the scripture says in Romans 12, right? New Testament. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. Why my body? Corinthians says, my body is what? The temple of the Holy Spirit in which God dwells. If I want to get my stuff together, I got to resolve to worship. So here's what I want to challenge you all, and then we're going to be pray. Because of who God is and what he's done, who alone? He alone. Come on, say he alone. He alone. Say it again. Say he alone. He alone. Deserves our worship. Holy Spirit, we thank you. We bless your name, God. We celebrate you for who you are. Thank you for your word, God. Come on, say, just open your mouth and bless him. Thank you for what you're teaching. Thank you for what you're doing. We resolve to worship God. We resolve to give you praise. We're not going to invite unauthorized agents into the temple. We won't allow things to be there who are not like you, God. You alone will occupy this place. Forgive us, God. Forgive us, God. Forgive us. We repent and we start afresh. We start afresh. So we give our time to you this morning, God. Should there be one here that don't know you, draw them. Draw them, God, to come to our relationship with you. Be God in our midst, Lord. You be God, Lord. Come on, sing together.